The first book of Genesis and the first chapter. In the beginning when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was a formless void and darkness covered the face of the deep while a wind from God swept over the face of the waters. Then God said, let there be light and there was light and God saw that the light was good and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning the first day. And God said, let there be a dome in the midst of the waters, and let it separate the waters from the waters. So God made the dome and separated the waters that were under the dome from the waters that were above the dome. And it was so. God called the dome sky, and there was evening, and there was morning, the second day. Scott Russell Sanders, he's an environmental activist and author, and a writing professor at the University of Indiana. I had uh, flown to Bloomington to interview him, and during the course of that interview, Scott Russell Sanders had some very interesting things to say about Wildness. So if you, if you look at the behavior of animals, the behavior of animals is very purposive, purposeful. Mm -hmm. uh, it's about food, it's about reproduction, it's about territory, it's about either being a predator or evading predators. It's, it's not uh, disorderly. Mm -hmm. It's quite orderly. So I think the way we often use the word wild, like a wild party, is a misuse of the, of the word. But another, another key thing about wildness is that the earth, uh, like our own bodies, has an extraordinary self-healing power. My hands are kind of beaten up right now because of some house maintenance work I've been doing lately. But you cut through your skin or you get a bad blister or whatever, or you, even you break a bone. And all things being equal, if you're reasonably healthy, your body will mend itself. Now, it won't mend from any degree of trauma, we know that, nor will the earth. But if a forest is cut down here in Indiana, uh, and you leave that ground alone, you're going to get a forest again eventually, because that's what the earth will produce. So that resilience, that power of renewal, Again, it's not limitless. You can trash a forest you can, uh, to, to the point where it won't recover. You can certainly, you can certainly poison a river to the point where in, in human, humanly meaningful length of time, it's never going to recover. You, if you drive a species ex to extinction, clearly it's not going to recover. But within bounds, the Earth's resilience is, which is essentially what wildness is, it's the, it's the ongoingness of all the natural processes. Within bounds, uh, if the damage is not too severe, the body will heal itself, a piece of ground will heal itself, the oceans will heal themselves, rivers will run clear. Mm -hmm. And that power of renewal in the wild world is a great source of hope, I believe. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. So the name of this reflection is The Wildness of God, but it also could have been titled What God Does Within the Chaos of Our Lives. So uh, you ever experienced chaos in your life? Well, good for you in a certain sense, in a sense it might mean that this service might be more meaningful than, than, than others in your experience. If you don't f suffer chaos in your life or experience that, well, you can just go to sleep. So, <laughs> but one of the things that is interesting about turning to this ancient, uh, this ancient document, which we call scripture, in order to uh, find wisdom to address the modern uh, day chaos that, that we experience, is that we discover that it is truly the mythological imagination of the scriptures that actually lends wisdom to our day. Mythological wisdom meaning, uh, again, the, as we've learned before, they weren't trying to teach us something that happened uh, in a certain way that we would be able to scientifically talk about or describe thousands of years ago. 
In Scripture, they, they talk about things that happen over and over again, stories that, that really are meant to point towards things that happen over and over again on up to our day. That's what's mythological about them. It doesn't mean they're made up or untrue. It actually means they're more true even than history. So when we, when we approach the Scriptures asking how do we deal with the chaos of our lives, it's rather interesting that the very beginning of Scripture talks about chaos. And again, it's not trying to talk about chaos from long ago so much as the chaos even now. You heard the scripture, it said in the very beginning, in the beginning, the world or the universe was simply a watery chaos. And again, they're not trying to describe scientifically, but they're trying to, to identify, though, the fact that chaos has always been there. If you're experiencing chaos in your own life, it's, you don't have to simply look to yourself to blame or to someone else to blame for that. Chaos has already always been part of the equation. So a certain amount of chaos is natural to the way things are. But what God does with chaos is rather interesting. God does not eliminate chaos according to our story. You heard it. As soon as God says, let there be light and shines light on the chaos, then... It does not say, and God eliminated the chaos and created creation. Rather, it says that God took that watery chaos and basically moved it apart, created a dome in the midst of it, a space where you and I could live. Now, this picture of the universe would not hold to modern scientific understanding, right? Uh, but what it shows is that they conceived of, the, of our world as surrounded by water. I mean, it's why the sky is blue, right? I mean, there's water up there, isn't there? And it's surrounded up there by water and surrounded underneath us uh, by water. That's the chaos. Our world is surrounded in, by chaos. Our world, like your world, my world, we're surrounded by chaos. And what does God do within chaos? Something that we ourselves cannot do by ourselves. The scriptures suggest that when we, when we turn to this God, God is able to create within the chaos a certain order. A certain amount of chaos, in fact, becomes the, the way experience, the scriptures would suggest, is really the context for creative life. That God is able to create within our life experience some ability to be fruitful, to multiply, to live into fullness of life. But that's not through getting rid of chaos. It's simply through ordering it in such a way that it promotes life. Now, when it comes to chaos, uh, we know that, uh, you know, and those, those chaotic waters, modern scientific uh, uh, thought will also inform our thinking that that chaotic water actually uh, is not as chaotic as we thought it was. We see the waves around the ocean going all over the place, cresting in here, cresting there, cresting everywhere. I mean, that's completely random, completely chaotic. But science has shown us that underneath that chaos, there is a certain order. That while we cannot predict exactly where a wave will crest, here or here or here, if we pay attention to where those waves crested, we could draw a probability diagram of where they might crest. And look what it looks like. Not chaotic. They call this, in chaos theory, the strange attractor meaning we cannot, we cannot predict it, the chaos, but the chaos does conform to a certain order with which is underneath it. It's probability. Well, nine centuries ago, the Christian saint John Scotus Eriogena, a Celtic Christian, observed that every visible thing, creature, and indivisible creature might be called a theophany, that is, a manifestation of God. He believed that God created the world in love, and therefore, because God created the world, everything that we see around us is some form of manifestation of God's love, and therefore is a revelation of God for us. Could it be that within the chaos of our lives, the revelation of the chaos of water? could point us in the direction of God. 
within your, the chaos of your own life, is there something that keeps pulling you, keeps drawing you deeper into a love that you just don't quite understand, to a grace that is deeper than you can produce yourself? Where in your own world do you find God hidden within the patterns? So, what's the opposite of wildness? Regimentation, uh, which freezes, tries to freeze uh, an institution, a, a mind, an organism at a certain state and fix it there. Wildness is a flow. It's always moving. Every organism is flow. Right now, it's not only the fluids in our bodies that are flowing around. We're breathing in and breathing out. We're taking in the atmosphere constantly. And we have to drink, we have to eat, and we have to excrete. And that flow is essential to wildness. The, so the opposite of that is fixity, is the effort to fix something. So a machine doesn't evolve. A machine is fixed. Uh, and it has certain virtues. We, do, we, we use machines all the time, and they have certain very valuable traits to them, but they're not wild. Mm -hmm. And their, their lack of wildness has to do with the fact that they're fixed. They also don't reproduce themselves. Uh, they don't grow. They don't evolve. And that capacity to change, that capacity to adapt, and that continuous flow, those are qualities of wildness. And the opposite of that, it seems to me, is fixity. And it applies to ideas as well. One of the problems with fundamentalism, whether it's fundamentalism in any religion, or fundamentalism in economics, where you believe you know, you've got your economic theory that, say, free markets will solve all problems, and you simply hold to that theory, there's fundamentalism in science, where you're just convinced this scientific theory is the only one, and you just hold to that. Fundamentalism is fixed, whereas real human thought flows. It's interrogative. It asks questions. It's open to new evidence. Those clips come from the Darkwood Brew videos that were produced when we did a series on, on creation. What, so if Saint, the Celtic saint Ariagena is correct, that, that 
every visible and invisible creature may be called a theophany or a manifestation of God. The fact that God creates this wild world then points to the possibility of God being wild as well, having some of those traits that are with, found from within creation. As Sanders and also the waves remind us, that doesn't mean chaotic necessarily, or random, at least in, to the sense that God is random. Rather, there's a purposefulness. There is uh, an orderliness even within what seems to be chaotic. And now Sanders is also suggesting that wildness is about flow over fixity. Could this tell us something about God? I mean, we, we tend to think of God being the unchanging, the eternal, the one who is always in, right there, <laughs> never moving, the unmoved mover. And certainly there may be a certain sense into which that is correct, we hope. We hope that God is not just loving now, but eternally loving. That God is not just gracious now, but is eternal, eternally graceful. And yet, even as we recognize that God is loving and graceful, if the world is changing infinitely, are there not infinite manifestations of God's love and grace that keep changing with the world? Could there be a flow to God? And if there's a flow to God, and we are created in the image and likeness of God, not to mention the fact that we are created with 72% water, which has flow of anything. Could there be a flow that is naturally inherent in our own life or needs to be in order to live most fully into our own humanity? Some of you know the story from early on in my ministry when I was a young minister in Scottsdale, Arizona. I, uh, there was an 80-year-old gentleman uh, who had kind of drifted away from the church and I went and visited him and I suggested that uh, one of the ways to kind of drift back was to attend a Bible study. And the gentleman looked me straight in the eye and said, I would never go to one of your Bible studies. I was like, but well, tell me more. He goes, it's not that I think you'd be wrong. Uh, I, you might teach me something brand new, but that's the point. I don't want to learn something new about my faith and discover that I've been wrong for 30, 40 years or all my life. I thought, how sad. Not sad that he didn't want to hear me, <laughs> but sad because he didn't want to then hear himself. I mean, if, it's, if at least 72% of us needs to be in flow as opposed to fixity, then to be most fully human is to engage with the changing nature of awareness. Thoughts change, awareness changes, and we need to sometimes are called to let go of our certainties in order to let God expand our world. But I was also sad, I have to confess, because that while I was only 35 years old at the time, already at 35 I could pinpoint areas of my life that I wanted to just not ever change. <laughs> like I could already realize that at 35 I was afraid of learning new things that might produce an awareness in me that I had been wrong for how many years. We all deal with it, don't we? Facing the unknown is scary. But if the scriptures are correct, if the revelation of water and wildness is correct, then embracing that flow is what makes us most fully human. It's not that everything is chaotic but everything needs to be attached to the wild and loving nature of God. Where are you resisting God expanding your horizons?
think of all the things that we could have had. Love is an ocean that I can't forget. My sweet 16, I would never regret. The other piece of paper from the Gospel of John. On the last day of the festival, the great day, while Jesus was standing there, he cried out, let anyone who is thirsty come to me and let the one who believes in me drink. As the scripture has said, out of the believer's heart shall flow rivers of living water. So this morning we are going to be commissioning uh, the youth among us who are going to be going on various mission trips in our congregation. It's the Faith Singers, which are, as years past, are going to be reminding us that part of the mission of God is to proclaim the good news. And through song and story, they do that. They lead, they go out, and they proclaim that good news. We're changing things a little bit this year, though, for our other youth who are going out on what has traditionally been what's traditionally been called the mission trip, where we normally will go and repair a house or do something on behalf of people who can't do something for themselves. This year, uh, those youth are going, uh, being sent to two places. Our high school youth are being sent to the Boundary Waters to canoe and to camp. And our middle schoolers are, are going to the Lost Creek Wilderness area to hike in Colorado. Both 
are there simply to experience the fullness of creation. Now, how is that mission? I had to ask that myself. Why did the youth board decide to send them out, just simply out into the wilderness? Mission? Didn't take me long, though, to click that into place. For our youth living in today's world, creation care is going to be part of their central mission for the rest of their lives. Because the world has changed. It's not like the world that many of us were born into. And I had to come into my own awakening to that fact a number of years ago. I had to wrap my hand around a few things just like I'd asked that 80-year-old gentleman in my Bible study to wrap his head around new awarenesses. When I realized that after taking a more careful look at the scientific evidence for global warming, the scientists are almost certainly right. And they're also right that, the, that our world is in danger. That if the, the carbon level in our atmosphere pushes up not too much farther than it is now, we'll actually trigger natural effects on our, in our, on our earth, releasing methane and other greenhouse gas producing substances that will actually accelerate global warming to the point where we could cut our carbon emissions to zero and the earth will continue to warm. Our best scientists tell us we have about 50 to 100 years to change that equation, to do whatever it is we are doing about to, 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 to increase the temperature, to reduce that. So for the rest of our used lives, creation care will literally be a central mission. And I had to get my mind wrapped around the fact that 50 years from now, when I'm 102, likely six feet under where I'm now, that if we haven't changed things and the world is truly in, in a cycle that will eliminate most of life as we know it and not be able to repair itself in a humanly meaningful period of time, that they'll be, one thing is certain that they'll be looking back to us now and they'll be saying, we could have changed things, and we didn't, and we didn't. And to me, when I came to that realization, it rocked my world. There's no way I want a youth 50 years from now to look back at me and say, you could have changed things, but you couldn't wrap your mind around it, so you just stayed with what you knew before. But when that chaos came into my own life and wondering like, oh my God, everything needs to change. What are we going to do? Everything needs to change. I was reminded of something similar to what we've been talking about this morning, especially when we're asking, where is God hidden in the patterns of your life? That if the world is truly in jeopardy, we can expect one thing to be, one, of one thing we can be certain, and that is that God has already been active to help us meet one of the greatest challenges that humanity has ever faced. That part of it isn't just about like how do we change everything, but just simply looking at what is and looking at how God has been active within our world already and claiming that. Now, a few years ago, when I gave my very first environmentally oriented sermon here, uh, I, I received an anonymous note from a parishioner, I think who was offended by something I had said. It was a reading which I actually loved and have cherished ever since. And to me, this speaks to how we don't simply change everything, but we look to what God has already been, how life has already been lived and claim some things that we haven't necessarily claimed in recent history and how actually we're not so far from being able to do what seems to us impossible. The reading was called The Green Thing. Checking out at the store, the young cashier suggested to a much older woman that she should bring her own grocery bags because plastic bags weren't good for the environment. The woman apologized and explained, we didn't have this green thing back in my earlier days. The young woman, woman responded, that's our problem today. Your generation did not care enough to save our environment for future generations. 
she was right. Our generation didn't have the green thing in our day. Back then, we returned milk bottles, soda bottles, and beer bottles to the store. The store sent them back to the plant to be washed and sterilized and refilled so it could use the same bottles over and over. So they really were recycled, but we didn't have the green thing back in our day. Grocery stores bagged our groceries in brown paper bags that we reused for numerous things. Most memorable, besides household garbage bags, was the use of brown paper bags as book covers for our school books. This was to ensure that public property, the books provided for our use by the school, was not defaced by our scribblings. Then we were able to personalize our books on the brown paper bags. But too bad we didn't do the green thing back then. We walked upstairs because we didn't have an escalator in every store and office building. We walked to the grocery store and didn't climb into a 300 horsepower machine every time we had to go two blocks. But she was right. We didn't have the green thing. Back then we washed the baby's diapers because we didn't have the throwaway kind. We dried clothes on a line, not in an energy gobbling machine burning up 220 volts. Wind and solar power really did dry our clothes back in the early days. Kids got hand-me-down clothes from their brothers or sisters, not always brand new clothing. But the lady was right. We didn't have the green thing back in our day. Back then, we had one TV or radio in the house, not a TV in every room, and the TV had a small screen the size of a handkerchief. Remember that? Not a screen the size of the state of Montana. In the kitchen, we blended and stirred by hand because we didn't have electronic machines to do everything for us. When we packaged a fragile item to send in the mail, we used wadded up old newspapers to cushion it, not styrofoam or plastic bubble wrap. Back then, we didn't fire up an engine and burn gasoline just to cut the lawn. We used a push mower that ran on human power we exercised by walking so that we didn't need to go to the health club to run on treadmills that operate on electricity. But she was right. We didn't have the green things back then. We drank from a fountain when we were thirsty instead of using a cup or a plastic bottle every time we had a drink, a drink of water. We refilled writing pens with ink instead of buying a new pen. And we replaced the razor blades in the razor instead of throwing away the whole razor just because the blade got dull. We didn't have the green thing back then. Back then, people took the streetcar or a bus, and kids rode their bikes to school or walked instead of turning to their mom or their moms into 24-hour taxi services in the family's $445,000 SUV or van, which cost what a whole house did before the green thing. We had one electrical outlet in a room, not an entire bank of sockets to power a dozen appliances. We didn't need a computerized gadget to receive a signal beamed from satellites 23,000 miles out in space in order to find the nearest burger joint. But isn't it sad the current generation laments how wasteful we old folks were because we didn't have the green thing back then. Please forward this on to another selfish old person who needs a lesson in conservation from a smart young person. We don't like being, being old in the first place so it doesn't take much to piss us off. <laughs> Especially from a tattooed, multiple pierced know-it-all who can't make change without a cash register telling them how much. <laughs> We're not so far off as we think we are from really doing the good that needs to be done in the here and now. I think if Jesus were standing here on Memorial Sunday preaching this sermon, he would remind us that it wasn't too many years ago that we sacrificed a whole lot more than this in order to win a war. He'd be asking us today, what are we willing to sacrifice to win the earth? Amen. 
At this time, I invite our youth forward, those going on the wilderness trips and those who are proclaiming the good news through singing to come forward to be commissioned for your work. Will asked if he could bring a prop up. I didn't realize it was a whole canoe. <laughs> there are many different gifts, but there is the same Spirit who gives them, who calls us to put them to use. There are many different ways of serving God, but it is the same Lord who is served. Each of us is awakened by the Holy Spirit to use our gifts and discover God's creation for the common good. Individually, we are members of the body of Christ, Together, we are the body of Christ. We are ready to embark on our mission experiences. We have prayed and prepared. We have gathered as a group and are ready to be sent out to be God's servants in the service of others and in protecting our shared home. Friends, you are entrusted by this congregation to embody God's love during these mission trips. Let us as a congregation join our words to theirs. Friends, you are commissioned to this congregation to share your skills and passions and to learn from the people you will meet and love the beauty of creation that you will encounter. We hope to participate in building community with each other and those whom we meet and serve and learn to love this home like God has made. We covenant with you and before God to journey with you in prayer and to be open to new ideas for action when you return. We joyfully expect to participate in God's mission with you through the experience of these trips. Go with our blessings. We look forward to your return. And teach us a few things, okay? <laughs> Amen. And so we remember on a night of betrayal and desertion, Jesus taking bread, stuff of the earth, stuff that St. Eugenia said is itself a theophany of God, taking the bread of the earth and breaking that bread, saying, my friends, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this as often as you eat of it in remembrance of me. So likewise, he took the fruit of the vine, which is itself a theophany of God, saying, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. By eating this bread and drinking this cup, we remember Christ's death, we celebrate Christ's resurrection, and we come to know that even in the harshest hour, when chaos threatens to overcome Everything, even in these moments, God is present, quietly providing the patterns that we need to claim to hold to life. And then when we, when we claim those patterns amidst the, the chaos, we discover a new creativity, a new way of being, a being that brings us most fully alive, making us most fully human. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. As our deacons come forward to prepare this table, I invite you to join me in reminding ourselves of who we are and whose we are. We are an open and affirming family of faith, welcoming all to God's table of love and acceptance. We are diverse yet united by Christ's example. We care for one another support one another, and challenge one another to become all that God creates us to be. 
We work together to nurture our community and promote peace and justice in our conflicted world. Amen.